Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to 3906 Chambers. Um, we are vaguely in person, which is a nice change. Um, uh, I am Selena Cahoon, uh, and on my left is Catherine Barnes. Um, she is one of the UK's highest rated planning genius under 35. I'm a bit older. <laughs> That's where I'm going to leave that subject. Um, uh, the, the topic for today is, as we say, back to basics, highways, um, public rights away and, and village greens for planners. Um, it's an area of law, both highways and, and village greens and, and uh, commons that um, is often um, deemed fairly esoteric as well as, as befuddling. Um, uh, which is all right for people like Catherine and I, but it can drive those of us uh, in the uh, uh, planning the field to distraction when you're trying to get something practical done. So we thought that it would be um, helpful to, to have a back to basic session. Um, uh, and I hope that um, it's going to spark a few questions, which of course we'll have time for uh, at the end. Um, Catherine's going to start looking at uh, public rights of way, and then I'll pick up on a few general points just um, to, to take you through that. Um, if any questions come that we aren't able to deal with in the time or that we can't immediately deal with, please let us have them uh, and we can get back to you um, through email or otherwise. Um, anyway, over to you, Catherine. Uh, thank you, Selena, and thanks everyone for giving up your afternoon to listen to us talk about um, highways. I'm um, going to deal really with how the rights arise in very basic terms, and then Selena's going to pick up more with what that means in practical terms um, when you've got a development affected. So I suppose the first really basic question, how do you know whether a site is subject to a public right of way? Um, and really there are two options. The easy option, if you like, is where the public right of way has already been formally recorded. And if it is formally recorded, it will be on something known as the definitive map. Um, and effectively local authorities are required to keep and update a definitive map for their particular area. So you would need to check that um, for your site and see what's recorded. Um, and the other important point to flag is that the definitive map is really quite significant because that's treated as conclusive. So in other words, if there's a public right of way on the definitive map, that's that. So unless you can amend the definitive map, and Selene is going to come on to talk about that, that is what the position is. Um, so that, as I say, is the more straightforward um, possibility. But it doesn't just end there. And I really can't stress enough how important it is to look into these questions broadly. and Don't just assume, oh, well, there's nothing on the definitive map, so there's no problem. Not quite that simple. Um, the law provides for rights of way for the public to accrue over a period of time, even if they're not actually yet formally recognised on the definitive map. And the main way that that happens, it's now recognised um, under statute, is under Section 31 of the Highways Act. Um, so I'll just read out the key bit. Where a way over land has been actually enjoyed by the public as of right and without interruption for a full period of 20 years, the way is deemed to have been dedicated as a highway unless there is sufficient evidence that there was no intention during that period to dedicate it. Um, so I'm going to look now in a little bit more detail at what some of those terms mean. So the summary position um, is essentially if there's been 20 years of public use, then there is a presumption that the landowner has dedicated their land to the public unless there's evidence to the contrary. 
And really, in a nutshell, the idea is that if a landowner lets people walk all over their land and use it to get from A to B for 20 years and doesn't do anything about it, they've had 20 years to stop it, then it's reasonable to infer that they were happy for the public to use it in that way. In other words, that they were effectively dedicating the land to the public. And some really important key elements, and when I come on to talk about village greens, you, they come up again. It can't just be any use, it's use as of right, which is rather a term of art. But effectively, it means the use can't be without force, secrecy or permission. Um, so in other words, the public have got to be brazenly and openly using the land. It, um, if they were, for example, breaking over fences to get into the land and use it, then that would be by force, so it wouldn't be as of right. If they were using the land at night time under the cover of darkness, or maybe they were kind of hiding in the bushes, well, the secret, the without secrecy requirement wouldn't be met. And, and if the landowner said, um, you've got permission to use the land, or maybe we'll come on to notices that put up notices saying the public are allowed to use my land, then that element of the definition won't be met either. So that's the first thing to think about. Then the use has to be without interruption. I mean, that doesn't literally mean that 24-7 the, um, the way has got to be in use. It just means continuous use in the sense that there's no actual prevention of the use. So for example, a locked gate that would stop the use being continuous. Um, in terms of the extent of the use or the extent of the right, that really depends on the way that the public have been using it over the 20 years. So if it's being used by foot, then the right will be to a footpath. If um, uh, cars are being used, or I mean, there's a whole range of things. It could be horses, God knows what. That will dictate the, the nature of the use over the 20 years will dictate then the extent of the right that um, crystallizes at the end of the 20 year period. Um, what, what is this 20 year period? You can't just randomly pick 20 years. It has to be the 20 years preceding the date when the public's right was brought into question. So um, I put various ways that the right can be brought into question on the slide. Um, but that's the period that you need to examine and it's calculated retrospectively from that date um, that the right's brought into question. Really importantly, and I'll come on to this again shortly, um, if at any point during the 20 year period, the landowner puts up notices or notice making it clear that they had no intention to dedicate the land as a public right of way, then the right won't accrue. So that effectively rebuts the, the statutory presumption that presumed dedication that section 31.1 is concerned with. So notices are a really um, useful tool for landowners to think about. Um, and then I've also just mentioned, it's quite unusual to be honest, but I've mentioned the common law position. Um, normally when rights of way occur over long use, it's under the Highways Act, Section 31, but it is theoretically possible for them to accrue over shorter time periods, any time period under the common law. Um, I've never, I've had to consider it when advising it, I've never actually come across a case where, I don't know, Selena might have, where I thought the test was satisfied, and typically that's because, mm -hmm. yeah, it's very hard, there's, um, there's, no, there's no presumption of dedication, unlike in section 31, so you would need evidence that the landowner positively intended to dedicate land, and in practice that's just Quite, I mean, I'm not saying it could never happen, but um, it's difficult to show. Um, so that's a whistle-stop tour of how the rights can arise. What then happens um, if you're a member of the public and you want to make sure that these rights aren't just theoretical, you want them to be recognised? Well, really, you want to get that right as soon as possible recorded on the definitive map, so there's no doubt about it. Um, and there's a 
set procedure for doing that. You'd make an application for the uh, map to be modified to add the public right of way. And that's an application under Section 53.5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. And there's a specific procedure set out in Schedule 14 for doing that. Um, and really, in a nutshell, it's then for the local authority, they'll consult on the application, they're required to investigate it, um, and then they will determine it. And I think there's sometimes a bit of confusion about this. They can't um, decide whether they think it would be desirable to have a public right of way. I mean, there might be really compelling reasons for a particular community why it would be nice. They can't look at that. All they can look at are, is that legal test in Section 31 of the Highways Act or under the common law for whether public rights of way have accrued. So there's no discretion. It's just does the law, do the facts of this case meet the legal tests? And the, um, I put SA, it's surveying authority, but really it's just the local authority. They might refuse to make an order because they don't think the tests are met on the evidence. And if that's the case, an applicant can appeal to the Secretary of State uh, and they may be may well be an inquiry if there's something worth looking into. Um, or if the authority decides to make the order, but it's opposed typically by the landowner, then it would need to be confirmed by the Secretary of State. And again, you may have an inquiry to, to look into that in more detail. Um, turning then to look at things from the other end of the telescope, from a landowner's point of view, what might you do to try and protect your land? Well, a very obvious um, thing to do and important is to lodge a notice under Section 31.6 of um, the Highways Act with the local authority. Uh, and there's a set form for doing that. I think, yes, I put the link on the slide. Um, and, and the effect of doing that is that it, if you like, it, it stops the clock. It wouldn't prevent any public rights of way which have arisen. So if you've had 20 years or more, if the test has been met, that right exists. But it's going forward for the next 20 year period. It's making it clear that the landowner has no intention to dedicate land to the public. So it's to protect the position going forward. Um, another uh, import, important tool for landowners, notices, and I've put a picture of an example notice. Um, actually, there are lots of these around Lincoln's Inn where <laughs> Lisa and I, because all the lawyers live around here, they, they're sort of very keen on their notices. Um, but as, as I said, under Section 31.3, the effect of a notice, an appropriate notice, is to rebut the presumption of dedication. Um, you need to be very careful that the wording, though, is right. So it can't just say something like private property that courts have held that wouldn't be specific enough. It needs to say something like no public right of way. So um, effectively, people can still use the still use the route, um, but it's making it very clear there's no intention to dedicate that land to the public. Um, and I would suggest if this is some, if it's a sort of relevant issue in respect of a particular site, just get into the habit of documenting these notices. Take photographs, dated photographs of them, and they're put up, document the date, and you it may in a few it may seem a pain at the time, but in a few years' time you may be incredibly grateful that you went to the effort of recording that information. Um, so moving on to village green rights which I'll try and do a bit more briefly. Um, the, test, uh, the, the test for the establishment, the right to register a village green is in section 15 of the Commons Act. Um, and the right, will, the right to register will arise where a significant number of the inhabitants of any locality or of any neighbourhood within a locality have indulged as of right in lawful sports and pastimes on the land for a period of at least 20 years. So again, you're probably seeing some similarities um, with what I've just talked about. So you've got to satisfy that test and also either have that um, recreational use continuing at the date of the application or 
have the, the use can stop, but then in England, the application has to be made within one year and in Wales, two years. Um, again, um, it's worth just unpicking the requirements in, um, in the um, subsection that I just read out. We've got this concept again, use as of right, which I've already explained. So it's not just any use, it's got to be without force, secrecy or permission. Again, we have this continuity requirement and sufficiency requirement. So there's, and, and really the way I think to, to think about this, because it all depends on the facts for a particular case, but the point is that there needs to have been enough use in terms of frequency, but also the level of use for it to have been clear to a responsible, reasonable landowner that the public were using the land in this way and asserting, asserting rights so that the landowner could have stopped the use or taken steps to stop the use if they wanted to. So it's about fairness to the landowner. Um, They've got 20 years to act and sort it out, but it has got to be clear to them in that 20 years that something is awry. Um, and, and clearly, just to be clear, there can be breaks in the use in a spatial sense or in a temporal sense. Spatial is not typically such a problem because um, if there's a particular area of the land which is not being used, then the application can just, or the registration will just be made for a smaller portion of the land. Um, but from a temporal sense, um, clearly if there's a, I don't know, three year gap where there was no use taking place, then you're not going to satisfy that 20 year um, criterion. Um, use in the form of lawful sports and pastimes sounds a bit anachronistic, but the courts have interpreted in quite interpreted it in quite a sort of modern pragmatic manner. So they said it's recreation as part of normal modern life. So things like dog walking, playing with children, anything like that would classify. You don't have to be out there playing um, fives or rounders <laughs> or cricket or some sort of um, old fashioned sport. Um, significant number, again, really that's just about alerting the landowner to the assertion of the rights. So it's got to be reasonably high number. Um, neighbourhood within a locality, um, I mean really this is, this is a very easy requirement to meet in my experience anyway, it sometimes looks a bit harder, but neighbourhood really that's just a question of judgement, so um, and it will depend on the facts, but any kind of area where you've got shared facilities for example, or there might be um, geographical boundaries like a road, uh, that means that you can legitimately say there is a neighbourhood, there has to be a sufficient degree of cohesiveness. And then really the locality requirement is a bit of a non-requirement. Locality means any administrative division known to law, and the courts have said that it can be more than one locality. And so normally any neighbourhood, as long as you can show that you're, you've got the cohesiveness to be a neighbourhood, almost by definition, you will be in a locality of some description. Um, a final point just to add, and there's been some recent case law on this for Village Green Geeks. Um, there is the statutory incompatibility doctrine, which where the land is owned by a public body will probably need careful consideration. In a nutshell, if the land is held for statutory purposes, so it might be housing, for example, or education, and those purposes are incompatible with village green use, then um, you're probably not going to be able to register the land as a village green. Um, so looking at it again from the two perspectives, if you're a member of the public and you think that village green rights have arisen, um, the way to get those formally recognised is to make an application for registration under section, section 15, um, I put the regulations in England, there's different regulations in Wales. Something very important to remember though, is that registration will be precluded if a trigger event has taken place. Um, and um, a trigger event in England 
includes various things, but including with an, when an application for planning permission in relation to the land is first publicised, and also when a draft development plan document which identifies the land in question for development is first publicised. And really this was introduced to prevent abuse of the village green rules by people objecting to development. So if you think that there is land in your area that really genuinely meets the village green tests, um, then I would suggest you make the application as soon as possible and don't wait for it to be threatened by development because once that application for plan planning permission has been publicised, you've lost your chance. Interestingly, in Wales, um, I discovered this only quite recently, the trigger event rules are much less strict. So there, it's the trigger event only takes place when there's actually been a grant of planning permission. So um, I don't know what Selena's experience has been. There was a, a, I found that when I first started practice, I had quite a lot of village green matters uh, and recently far fewer, mm. although I have got one in Wales at the moment, actually. <laughs> Which is why you yeah. the trigger. <laughs> and I wonder if maybe this is something in Wales that particularly as maybe as the rules become more known that may become an issue for people developing land in Wales. Um, and then finally, in terms of what landowners can do, um, rather like a notice under Section 31.6 of the Highways Act, there's an equivalent under Section 15A for village greens. So you can lodge a statement with the local authority. Um, and you can see it says um, the, the effect of the statement is to bring to an end the period during which people have indulged as of right in lawful sports and pastimes. So it's actually a bit more generous than the position under the Highways Act. Um, mm. if, you, if your um, 20 years hasn't yet accrued, then a statement under Section 15 will solve the problem. It will just stop time running. And so a successful application would only be possible if another 20 years clocks up. Um, and if the 20 years has already been met, then an application would have to be made within the next year. So there's a sort of narrow window in which an application would have to be made. Um, uh, and it's the same form online as I posted earlier for public rights of way. Um, and then the other thing that you can do, which is a really powerful tool, is erecting signs. Um, just be careful about the wording, the court. <laughs> but there's been quite specific about what your signs need to say. And I put one particular form of wording that's been endorsed by the senior courts, which says the public have permission to enter this land on foot for recreation, but this permission may be withdrawn at any time which if you think about the concept use as of right makes sense because as soon as the landowner is giving permission for the public to use the land and recreate in a recreational way, that use is with the landlord's landowner's permission. So you're not going to be satisfying the as of right test. So it's a nice way of the landowner protecting their rights, but also allowing the public to continue using, using the land um, in the meantime. And that's frequently by right as well, isn't it? As opposed to as of right, that's how can't people can compare. The, 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 I'm physically permitting you either through an agreement or through science. Um, the, the, so it's a, one, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quick way of saying I am here by right as opposed to as of right. Mm. Anyway, so I've interfered with you. <laughs> um, this, is, um, this is my little section of, of the presentation. Um, I have tried to pick through some of the issues that, that um, I have dealt with over the years with regard to highways and, and, and development, either developing highways themselves um, or in effect um, through issues that have arisen um, with uh, trying to get planning development um, through and or uh, problems that have arisen after planning permission has been granted. Um, so I'm going to try and cover a few areas. There are the Highways Act, as you probably, those who've had to dip into it know, is a huge act. And um, there are many aspects of it that I don't deal with, but I'm going to try and, and pick through a few of them. The, the first question I've asked, 
um, is is what is a, a, a highway, or, or you know, how do you decide um, whether something is or is not a highway? And I, I've given you a few pictures there. Um, the, the, all of those potentially are highways. Um, the, the first question, sorry, <laughs> the first question I've got though, um, it, it deals with with the, the legal extent of the highway. I was going to start looking at physical aspects, but I thought actually it really does come down to what is the highway as a legal thing. Um, uh, and the first and important uh, 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 fundamental aspect of a highway is that it must be a right that the public can deploy uh, and it's the public at large. Um, so any member of the public is entitled to use that particular uh, uh, road, highway, street, whatever you want to call it for the moment. Um, and that is to be contrasted with uh, a, an owner of a particular property an occupier of a particular property, or indeed the owner of, of, of the particular piece of, of road, um, as well as the lawful visitor to that particular property. And, that, and I've set out a, a, a reference to a case called, I can never pronounce this, Cutten Gaon Car, and that's probably not quite the right way to do it, but anyway, that's a 2012 case that looked at these aspects. The second important part is that it is the right of that public at large to pass and repass along the highway. Um, and that is a, from a, a very old uh, 18th century case. Um, but also that is further qualified by an interesting case that happened back in 1999 when people were trying to um, object to the proposals then in relation to um, the A303 along Stonehenge. And, um, those works came a lot later, and I'll come back to that uh, much later. But what the, those who sought to assemble on the highway, they weren't actually uh, uh, in, in the carriage way itself, preventing people from driving up and along it, but were at the side. Uh, and um, they were duly um, uh, 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 prosecuted for obstructing the highway. Uh, and uh, subsequently, the, that, that, uh, those convictions was overturned by the House of Lords. Because uh, what was held, what was suggested was that, that the, the right to use the highway isn't simply a question of keep on moving. You can, you know, as long as you're carrying out an activity, you have a right to be on the highway. And as long as you're carrying out an activity that, that's otherwise lawful and doesn't obstruct, then that activity can be something you're entitled to do, and that is not going to get you in trouble. It, if it was coming from a more civil aspect, I suspect that, that if you were actually trying to, to use the highway simply for a recreational activity, so if you were trying to, trying to use it for some of the, the activities you would normally be carrying out on a village green or common, that might get you into a bit of trouble. But the, the principal point about Jones is that, that there, it was a criminal offence and it was based on obstruction. And if you're not obstructing, and you're carrying out a, a, a lawful, any other kind of lawful activity, then you should be all right. The third point I've put down is, is that it needs to be a known and identifiable route. Uh, and it's it's a route is the is the, the, the main thing there, I think, because um, it, it doesn't have to be a metalled highway. It doesn't actually have to be anything formal. It has to be a known and identifiable route because we're talking about all kinds of uh, highways. Um, the other part of the right to the public's use is, is the extent of that use, so which to some extent is really more uh, the classification of it, and, and Catherine has already touched on that. Um, I, I've put, out the, put forward the, the, the three traditional um, uh, um, ancient parts of, of the common law that, that identify uh, what you can have in terms of a highway. Uh, and set it up there. It's a, um, it, it, it's a common law. Highways are of three kinds according to the degree of restriction of the public rights of passage over them. So you have a, a full uh, a, a cartway over which you can walk on foot um, or you can ride your or accompanied by your beast of burden uh, and with vehicles and cattle. Uh, a bridleway, uh, as those will be familiar with, with um, is a highway over which the rights of passage are cut down by the exclusion of the right of pass with vehicles and sometimes, although not invariably, the exclusion of the right of driftway. 
So a bridleway is not simply just for horses. Uh, and lastly, we have a footpath, is one over which the public um, only have a right of passage on, on foot. There are other titles that have since arisen since that ancient law, but those are the three principal categorizations of highway. Now, one of the questions that I've had to come across now and again is whether a cul-de-sac can actually uh, be part of the highway. Um, in terms of logic, it would, in many cases, have tried to argue, well, it shouldn't really be because it's not a, it's, it's, a, it's in its nature a, a very simple and cut off part of the highway or part of a road that only allows access to um, the, the owners of the property uh, at the end or attached to uh, uh, adjoining that particular route. Nevertheless, um, uh, there are two cases I've mentioned there, White House and then more recently Shandos Land. I say more recently, it's 1910. There's a lot of very old cases that you have to look at with those. Um, that said that, that you know, once a user is established by the public, then um, that is a highway. Um, so it is quite possible for uh, a cul-de-sac to be a, a part of the highway. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, lastly, and um, again, this, will, this kind of overlaps with the, the physical extent of the highway. It is a, the, the a formal part of um, the nature of the highway is that it vests as a right uh, in the highway authority. Uh, and I've referred to section two, section, so, sorry, 263 of the Highways Act, um, which describes that the, 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 the right that is vested um, uh, as being it's necessary for its control, protection and maintenance for the use of the public. But um, that is the description given uh, back in, uh, as I say, 1896 through the, the famous Baird case. Now, um, the, the, for those uh, property nerds out there, the, the right is in fact a, a proper legal rem. Uh, it is a determinable fee simple. So um, it's a, something that you can in effect possess as a highway authority. And, and that can sometimes, uh, I think, be forgotten. It is actually a highway authority's possession. Now, oops, wrong one. <laughs> now, physical extent. Typically, obviously, um, we have, uh, uh, you look to a, a carriageway, which is where um, the, you will be doing your passing and repassing, but potentially, clearly, we're looking at um, uh, 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 a, uh, um, a carriageway proper, uh, in other words, that carrying um, vehicles. There will be a verge to that. There will also there can also be verges to footpaths, um, but also there is this um, uh, interesting part of um, the the law that looks at roadside ditches. Um, the the fact that roadside ditches um, can sometimes um, provide a form of boundary in itself. Um, has actually often arisen uh, as a query as to whether that creates the edge of the highway or whether it's part of the highway itself. Uh, uh, and um, let me come and look at a couple of cases on that. Um, private rights of way, um, where do we find them? Those clearly, um, Catherine's referred to the definitive map under the WCA, but that uh, uh, description in the definitive map and the statement sets out the width of, should set out the width of that private right of way. If it isn't in there, then you have to look to other aspects. Uh, and sometimes it is said that there is a presumption that the width of that footpath highway, whatever you want to call it, in terms of be being a highway, is either of hedge to hedge or fence to fence. In other words, the whole area between those two features. However, <laughs> uh, there are uh, three cases that I've set out there where um, it, it, it was this issue was considered um, and a number of judges have gone from saying, well, their presumption really clearly needs to arise you know, between you know, that, that the highway is between each hedge or each uh, fence. Uh, and that was wheeled back, rode back from um, in Neild, um, uh, uh, and that presumption 
was described uh, as being only if you have sufficient circumstances. So you have to take everything else into account before the presumption arises. Uh, uh, and lastly, there's a case of Bainan um, uh, and um, that looked at uh, Verge in the same context. Uh, and uh, I've set out the words of, of, of Justice Hale, as she was then, um, uh, which goes through the whole series of, of points about whether that presumption arises. Um, I'm not going to read it out, but um, it, it, is, it is one of those where you can look to all of the facts, and that may include having to look at some extremely old uh, um, maps and plans, uh, and in particular, looking at why it was that the hedge or fence was put up, when it was that the hedge or fence was put up. But once you've established there's a good reason that there was a, a, or was a relationship between the hedge or fence and the land on either side, uh, and then the, 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 the way that, that does exist between the two, um, and that there was perhaps a, a, an obvious connection between that is the highway and the fence or hedge is providing that boundary, that is a presumption. And that can only be rebutted by saying, well, there is a good reason to suggest that that uh, hedge or fence was there for that, that boundary purpose. Um, the other famous bit of, of uh, highways law that describes um, the physical extent, which deals with the vertical extent, is this point about the top two spits or the, the baird principle. And the spit, for anybody else though, who doesn't know, is a spade depth. <laughs> um, the top two spits um, we, we will probably still continue to use, but it is now, as a consequence of a, a recent case in 2018, London Borough of Southwark and TfL, it is now known as the zone of ordinary use. Uh, and that describes, in effect, a little bit more, it's a bit more flexible in terms of where the, the right goes, goes down to and underneath the physical uh, uh, perhaps a physical sort of surface of the highway. Uh, uh, and um, uh, there is also a, a, an above surface airspace uh, uh, um, characteristic to the interest that vests in the highway authority. Uh, and uh, it is this, this zone of ordinary use uh, it's a, a depth sufficient to provide for its support and drainage and drainage is an important aspect that to remember that because clearly there's going to be when you're looking at most highways there's a lot of infrastructure within the highway itself but also what we call a modest slice modest slice of airspace i wonder what that means. <laughs> a modest slice of airspace above it sufficient to enable the public to use and enjoy it and the responsible authorities will maintain and repair it so that is where we are with regard to physical extents. Thanks. Now, I've just had a, thought of a list of, of other common classifications that aren't really classifications. If you happen to come across them, there is no real magic, I'm afraid, in any of those phrases. Trunk road, perhaps, uh, and uh, clearly motorway, uh, and potentially unclassified county road. I've had to deal with that very recently. And an unclassified county road is something is something that existed some time before <laughs> the, the 1980 Act. Um, uh, and one would have to, I'm afraid, look back to uh, the Enclosure Acts uh, and the time when roads started to become a bit more um, uh, uh, widely spread and also metalled. And we had the, a changeover in terms of who was responsible for them. Special road is not a, it's not a term that is actually used either. I put it together with motorway, but they are not the same. Um, it is the kind of the, the earlier uh, uh, um, justification, as it were, for that, that term. Um, a highway is maintainable at public expense, and that is a term that um, is used a lot, uh, uh, clearly through the, throughout the 1980 Act. Um, but a highway that is not maintainable at a public expense is still a highway. Uh, and sometimes I find that local highway authorities because it's, because it's not formally maintainable at a public expense, is not treated as a highway, and that is not correct, I'm afraid. The last thing, a private road or private street, 
that you could call it a highway if you like, but it's not, <laughs> which is why I wanted it that. So, um, looking at uh, highway authorities, section one of the Highways Act 1980, you've got two principal uh, highway authorities. First, the Strategic Highway Authority, which is the, the Secretary of State of Transport, uh, and the Secretary of State of Transport um, acts through uh, uh, Highways England, which is now a company, uh, and that is responsible for the strategic road network. So in other words, trunk roads and, and motorways. Um, the local highway authority, uh, which for London is TfL, but specifically in relation to Greater London uh, um, Authority roads, but elsewhere local borough, uh, London borough councils, uh, uh, that, again, that's in the London, but outside of London, it is county or uh, metropolitan district councils. Um, they are the highway authority. In many, many circumstances, you will all be familiar with the fact that, that district councils often act, uh, they have the power to act, to maintain and carry out various highway authority uh, duties. Um, but that is something that has to be agreed with the principal uh, local highway authority. Functions and duties, well, um, I, I, there are many. <laughs> I have not set them all out there, um, but um, uh, uh, the, the local highway authorities who are, who are uh, for all non-strategic highways, whether or not maintainable at public expense, which is the uh, uh, point I'd emphasize earlier, which is they are responsible, uh, even if it's not maintainable or formally maintainable at public expense, that's all set out at the beginning of the Highways Act. Um, there is a general duty um, uh, understood in law um, on highway authorities to facilitate the safe and unobstructed use of the highway by the public. And that is where all the duties to uh, um, repair and maintain uh, come from. Um, it is ensuring that the public can pass and repass safely and unobstructed. The duty to maintain under section 41 has given rise to a great deal of, of uh, litigation. It is now seemingly settled. Uh, I am not going to go through it in any um, uh, great detail, but um, it's important to, to be aware of it. Uh, and um, it can be something that uh, uh, planners and developers keep in mind when um, they're trying to construct their uh, um, the developments and there may be issues as to how and what's happened to the highway. Um, the duty to protect and assert the rights of user, that's section 130, uh, and indeed uh, that deals with the structured part. And there are similar duties under part three of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, Catherine has dealt with, in some sensible and extremely helpful detail about the creation of highways. I'm not going to re repeat that. Um, now, how do you find those highways? Uh, if you've got a site, how on earth do you actually identify it? Yes, of course, we can all look at a map, but uh, in the first instance, the definitive map and its statements will should provide you with those, um, those paths and highways. And indeed, we had a question just before um, the uh, before having this web webinar that, that pointed to the fact that there was a, 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 a footpath shown on a site, but it no longer formally existed physically, and whether um, that was a matter that could be taken account of, and, and the fact that there had been an alternative route already found. Now, the fact that something doesn't look, doesn't exist physically, or you can't see it on the ground, I'm afraid is no answer. The definitive map and the statement <laughs> Uh, uh, under section 56 is is the is the de definition of where it is and that is conclusive as, as Catherine said so it's really important to start there when you're looking at a site go to the definitive map and see what it is there's that, <coughs> that is shown across your site or even on the edge of it um i've talked about lists of highways it's a very general point to make but but highway authorities th themselves are are required to identify where their highways are and usually this will show the extent uh, of that usually marked in blue um there are also um local uh, the, the district councils who are given the responsibility of carrying out maintenance they will have lists and maps showing again the extent of the of the highways that they maintain 
So that is a further indication of where you might look to see how the, extent, the full extent of your highway uh, uh, and indeed whether what you are joining or what, what you are entitled to access is really highway or whether it may be uh, still a, a private uh, piece of land. Lastly, I thought it was sensible just to, to come back to this point that under Section 31A, uh, as Catherine said, if, if you uh, if you can if you want to be clear that you have not dedicated um, a, 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 a highway, or if you um, consider that there is something amiss, then you must put forward a declaration, and that will be lodged. And you can find those declarations. So again, have a look when you are um, uh, by a site, or, or whether you're not fully clear as to what rights uh, uh, apply to that site, go and have a look at Section 31A list. A couple of issues. So firstly, um, you need to make sure uh, uh, about the impact from your development. Uh, the principal test remains, although it is slightly changed in 2019 under the then PPF, that if your the development should only be prevented or refused on highways grounds, if there would be unacceptable impact on highway safety, all the residual impact, cumulative impacts on the road network would be severe. Now, the new part to that in 2019 was the unacceptable impact on highway safety. Highway safety was always an issue, but the test was always quite, that was the high one that was severe. So um, it, it is an either or. Um, it is quite a high hurdle though, that severe one. Uh, and indeed, uh, I would encourage um, developers just to, to make sure if there are no issues on, on highway safety, then the residual impact of, of severity is, is quite a, a, um, a um, perhaps a, a helpful one if you're trying to get a development across the line. Um, once you've carried out your assessment, um, if it's been established um, that, that you you obviously, you may need full access works, but if your access works have an impact on the highway, or indeed the impact from your development requires further off-site highway improvements, um, then um, clearly a close relationship with the local highway authority is going to be fundamental. Um, uh, the other thing to remember, uh, and this is something that, that um, comes up now and again, is that, that sometimes the red line of your uh, site stops short of the area that's needed for the highways works. Um, you can get around this, um, but uh, especially if you're not, you yourself are not building on, on, on that area of, of highways works. But um, in, in my view, it is far better that you incorporate, and indeed some highway authorities insist on it, that you incorporate that area of land that is strictly for your highways works within your red line, because you need planning permission um, a highway authority is, uh, um, does have a, a, a permitted development rights to carry out improvement works, but, but you as a, as a developer or uh, you as a highway authority concerned about uh, works being carried out needs to make sure that the planning permission is covered or the planning permission has in effect can be granted for those works. Um, just keeping an eye on the time. Um, uh, the, Big point about section 38 and section 278 agreements, which are, are we, we kind of bunch them in with section 106, is that they are um, they are clearly coming from two different directions. The section 38 agreement is when you want to uh, construct a road for subsequent adoption. So you yourself carry out the works and then and then and then uh, you dedicate the, the the highway to the authority. It's normal. Uh, that's a normal practice for internal state roads. So you carry out the works, and then you go. So um, uh, this is now dedicated as highways. Um, it, it allows um, a, a privately maintainable highway to become a highway maintainable at public expense. That the key th thing there is that you must remember to dedicate, otherwise it will remain a privately maintainable highway, which you don't necessarily want. Um, uh, and section 278 is where highway authorities enter into an agreement with a developer for the execution of the works which are to be paid for by the developer. Uh, and, this must, and this must be on the basis the highway authority are satisfied it will be a benefit to the public. Um, now I've asked a few questions there um, uh, about what, if, uh, uh, you know, what, what problems may arise over these two development uh, issues. 
uh, what if the hiring authority objects and won't engage? What if you as a hiring authority um, cannot see a solution to these issues? What if local planning authority takes a different view to the hiring authority? What are the consequences of that? Uh, and uh, what if you uh, forget <laughs> what if you forget to dedicate properly all the, uh, your section 38 road? Now, um, these are all uh, matters that I cannot <laughs> answer and I think again, in the next five minutes. However, um, they are all issues that are soluble. The main point here is that they can cause uh, extreme uh, problems with development, um, but that uh, the earlier that these issues are, are uh, um, spotted, the better. Now, let's just have a look at the time. We've got 10 minutes left. Um, I think, um, uh, uh, let's have a look at whether we've got any um, Q&A. Right. We've got a few questions, which uh, are, I suspect will be very good to ask. The rest of my presentation looks at um, uh, um, what you do about um, private rights where across your land uh, and also um, uh, um, whether you, you, you know what, what higher authorities can do to create uh, rights of way but I think perhaps let's enter into um, the, the Q&A don't you think? I'm happy with that um, or if otherwise we have time you can at the end you yeah. can continue just round off a little summary if you want to. Yeah so um, Let's just have a look firstly, uh, what about discovering lost ways? Now, I'm not entirely sure what a lost, what is meant by a lost way, um, but uh, if it's, if it's, uh, if you have a, um, if you have a, a path or, or private right of way or something that looks like a footpath that has not been identified on, on the definitive map, um, and you believe that it's properly should have been put on the definitive map in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. That is something that can be the subject of, uh, of an order under the WCA. Um, it, the, the difficulty is if it's not on the definitive map, um, it's very difficult uh, for that. There's no presumption that arises um, it's, uh, uh, um, but I don't know, Catherine, whether you think that there are other ways of, of, of dealing with something that you realise is, is, should have been identified um, back in the 1950s and the works carried out. I think it all just depends on the evidence. I've done some cases, um, I mean, they can be really interesting, actually, in a kind of geeky way where you're looking back at enclosure awards yeah, yeah. way back. And ultimately as selena said once a highway always a highway if that right has accrued and you can positively prove that then you should be able to get the definitive map amended you know as long as that test that i took you through is met it's just that obviously the further back you go the harder it is to get the evidence to prove that um but that's not to say that it can't be done you know archival research and so on um, what about the next one? Yeah, so, now this, this is really interesting. So the Finance Act uh, was, was... I think, shall I, do you want to read the question? Oh, sorry, yes. The participants. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So um, we were asked whether a common law would not a declaration that a way was a public highway under the Finance Act be seen as deemed dedication. The, the, the short answer is yes and no, because the Finance Act um, was and the way that it treated uh, highways was for a very specific purpose, obviously a financial purpose. The question as to whether it actually, whether that, that particular road operates as, uh, as a highway with all the commensurate legal and, and physical extent it is, is actually, in my view, very different. So it would always be part of the evidence uh, as to you know, whether or not what you have is properly a, 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 is properly a highway. But if, for example, um, a, a highway authority has never recognised um, in a plan, uh, going back to the time of the Finance Act, that, that even if it has been drawn on the, 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 the maps that accompanied the finance. If it's, if, it's, if it's only there and it's not anywhere else, 
for example, on Ordnance Survey maps, then it, that, that deemed dedication doesn't arise because it's the purpose of the finance that was different. It wasn't in order to say this is a, um, a dedicated or created highway. So it, it would be definitely part of the, the evidential um, exercise, but not a, a, an immediate um, uh, presumption. Um, what's the next one? Is planning permission required for works to a road that is unadopted, also private? Is this still classed as a highway? Well, planning permission is required for, for works full stop. Um, uh, um, uh, and if it's if it's a, a, a highway, a proper uh, um, either a public maintainable or a highway uh, um, recognised as such, um, then it will it, it will be subject to either PD rights or indeed if you need to to do further works, um, it would have to be through. Um, potentially through through an order depends upon what it is that you, you want. But um, uh, if it's a private uh, land and you don't own it and it's used as an access way, then again, you would need planning permission uh, to use to planning permission on that private piece of land to, to carry out the works. Um, it really, I'm afraid, depends upon what it is you want to do, but um, bottom line is development is development and planning permission is required for development uh, and um but, i mean obviously if it's the highway authority doing the works and they're improvement works within the boundary of the highway then there's an exception carved out in section 55 so no planning permission required but i think i don't quite understand what the question is getting at but i think if it the point being if you're a private landowner and you want to undertake works to your land if ultimately that meets the definition of development in section 55 you know you're not a highways authority no. so you're not going to come within that particular exception then yes you're going to need um planning permission and like selena says it depends on the work you know if it's a bit of kind of repair work well that's not going to come as development but if you're changing the route or the boundaries of it or whatever it may be then you know it will be yeah. um right what's the next one I mean, the, the, this, just coming back to that question we were asked before the seminar, uh, the, the, whether you, know, you, you, you realise that there has been a, a, a footpath on the definitive map, but it's now not even practical to use it, but there's an alternative that's perfectly acceptable, what would you do with that? Um, well, I think you're just going to have to apply to amend the definitive map. Um, as Selena said, if um, just because in practice, in real life, as it were, on the ground, a sensible solution has been found. I'm afraid in law, that's not going to help you very much. Mm. But I would have thought it's not actually going to be that difficult to modify the definitive map. No, it's in just circumstances like it's that. It's just a way procedure, it's sort of, you're going to have yeah, to go through it. But it's an important procedure, yeah. nonetheless. Um, but I think that sure. that's why going to the definitive map first, before you even, you know, even interested in the site is is a really important part of your research because it can create all kinds of subsequent problems um, because some people do get very very um, enthusiastic about the definitive <laughs> map uh, and uh, there can be strong objections and if you find yourself you build a house across a footpath that could be um, really um, catastrophic. <laughs> This um, is quite just an interesting yeah. comment, really. I'm sorry, I don't know the time. Yeah, we probably just need to wrap up, but should we um, try this first one? Yeah, yeah. so someone has commented. Um, sorry, I'm saying someone because apparently for GDPR reasons, we shouldn't say the name. <laughs> but it's right. um, We have recent experience of highway authorities seeking section 278 works in addition to highway works identified in section 106 agreements where perhaps these works would not have passed the relevant section 106 tests okay um which is i mean i haven't personally come across that but that is something to look out for um i would have thought and that is quite naughty if you're trying to circumvent um, well it really depends when your agreement was entered into because if the section 106 was entered into prior to or at the time of your planning permission 
then it's supposed to pass those tests. And if the works that are being sought are not required as a consequence of, of, of the development, then again, that's, that would be unusual. Section 278 itself obviously isn't subject to uh, any still um, uh, 122 test. So, um, uh, uh, and, but, but in just to, to pick up on the, the fact that, because you, you can have a com combination of section 106 and 278, and sometimes even 38 with it, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, but uh, principally, uh, if, if you're agreeing to do works that aren't justified by your development, you could still carry them out under section 278. Um, but because it's it, it because two two and is, is basically a, a funding agreement. Yeah, I think yeah, it, I, I might be misunderstanding the question. I think okay. if well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this is the problem when you do it um, remotely. But if if the implication is that the the highway authority is trying to circumvent the restrictions of section one hundred and six by kind of requiring extra work, you know, where it's the basis on which permission is being granted. Um, then that's quite interesting and mm. something that obviously need to be careful. I mean, that's something that should be looked at when planning permission is granted. If there are particular highways works that are needed to make the planning impacts acceptable, then that's something that yes. needs Actually, to be I mean, part I, of the grant of permission. It, it, I, I think what it might mean is that there's a there's a 106 and there's a section 2, so that's not a combined agreement, and that um, they, these are additional works to... That, that that went through or, or passed through the one one two two tests. So I, I, I think that that given that it's a funding agreement um, and doesn't have to necessarily be justified um, by the planning commission, I, I, I can see why that might arise. Whether you should agree to it or not is a different matter. But two seven eight, as I say, is is a, is a different vehicle. Just there's one more here about whether an outline permission with an indicative master plan showing development over a private right away, um, whether it would overwrite any requirement. No, it wouldn't. No, I'm afraid not, um, because planning permission doesn't have that sort of power. Um, it, uh, uh, um, you know, the definitive amount, I'm afraid, wins out. And indeed, that's why, maybe we should end on this, that's why these issues are so important, because it can scupper a development oh, right completely. at the final stage. I mean, I'm not suggesting in all likelihood it would be possible to divert that public right of way. It's you know, probably not a problem, but it may take a very long time. And indeed, it's possible that it won't be. So you could have this wonderful planning permission to do exactly mm. what you wanted to do, um, but not be able to implement it. And it doesn't mean that the, that the planning permission is unlawful either. You can mm. you can grant permission over it, but because it's a legal constraint, not a planning constraint, but it does mean that you're going to have to tackle it. Yeah. There was a further question, but I'm I'm so sorry. I don't think we've got we've got time we've got time to deal with it. But we'll try and pick those those extra points up. Um, and indeed, if anybody's got any other burning issues that they wish they they had asked, then please feel free to contact us. That would be um, uh, our pleasure. Um, thank you very much indeed. And thank you all for attending. Um, uh, and um, Catherine, thank you. Thank you, Selena. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye.